welcome everyone for the few people that are on the call at the moment and a big welcome to Amy. Thank you, Amy, so much for joining us. We'll uh, we'll come over to you in a moment. Um, so, yes, yeah, so welcome to this meetup. Sorry, there was a little bit of a confusion with this, um, a little bit of uh, administration error in the back end. So sorry to everyone. Anyone that thought it was going to be a live meetup, um, we have decided to run this one as an online only meetup. We do have, hopefully you've seen through the Meetup website that we are planning to have Marco Russo with us next month in October, and that will be a live um, only Meetup. So there'll be no online for that session. Um, so we'll send out more details as we get closer. I can't remember, Imam, is it maybe like the 21st of October or? 11th of October. 11th, uh, okay. Yeah, let me yeah. check. But yeah. So we'll, we'll follow up. Um, after this and we'll announce that if we if we haven't already done so but just a heads up we have moved the um the meetup we normally try and do it sort of the third tuesday of the month but because marco's available um you know we obviously want to take advantage of that so so that'll be coming up next month um but more importantly this month we have uh, amy holden joining us and I had the pleasure of meeting Amy recently. I needed to reach out for her professional services to do some work in Power Automate. And um, I was really amazed at how good Power Automate was. I also realized by working with Amy that as a Power BI guy, there's a lot to learn in, in these different products. And I'm far from an expert. I mean, if I was an expert, I wouldn't have needed to engage with Amy to help me out. But uh, so I really enjoyed that experience and I thought it would make a great session for our user group for Amy to come along and tell us a little bit about Power Automate and hopefully show us some stuff that um, that we could use practically um, to get you might, and Amy, you did say it was okay to record the session, right? So be my guest. Yeah, so that'd be great. So we'll publish that um, somewhere for for our user group to come back and have a look at later on if you'd like to try and take the learnings that Amy gives us tonight and hopefully get some more value from Power BI. So so with that, I'll hand over to Amy and um, to introduce herself and be dazzle us. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Um, so I'm going to actually use my experience with Matt as a bit of an, an inspiration for what we're going to talk about. So I didn't realise this would be useful to people. So it's kind of just stuff that I do. Um, so I'm actually going to use that as an example, walk through that, throw in loads of random bits of useful power, automate stuff along the way. I'm not going to teach you anything useful about Power BI because I am absolutely rubbish at it. So that's why I need you. Um, so I'm going to teach you about some Power Automate stuff that might be useful for you in what you do. Um, so we named it quite cheesy, I think, isn't it? Power Automate, the best friend of Power BI. It's cute. Um, and I'll introduce myself first, since I started talking. And this is as far as a slide by goes for today. This is as good as it gets. I hope you're ready. Um, so my name is Amy Holden. I didn't update my job title on here. Apparently I'm a CX specialist, but I do a lot with Dynamics 365, Power Platform, um, more recently Power Automate, but before that I was more into the Dynamics 365 side. Um, a little bit about me, I work for this really great person called Amy Holden. She's great. Um, I love working for myself. It's the best thing I've ever done. Highly recommend it if you get the chance. I'm a Microsoft MVP in business applications. Um, I mentioned Power Automate already. I have a large obsession with Vegemite and I also have a large obsession with my dog. I apologize in advance for the dogs today. I acquired an extra one from my friend and they're currently having a discussion. So it could become entertaining at some point. Apologies in advance. Um, I also like Dynamics Marketing, which is where I've done a lot of things. And I like running a lot. So that's a little Strava icon for anyone that recognizes it. Um, I like running in straight lines for long periods of time. Apparently it's fun. OK, that's a bit about me. That's what I do. And next up, oh, that's my end slide. So I'm just going to start showing you stuff. The end. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. I don't bite and I'm pretty, pretty nice sometimes. 
So just uh, on the questions, Amy, so everyone else is on uh, permanent mute. So if anyone sorry, has any questions, questions, that's okay. No, please put them in the chat. And um, and so Iman and I will keep track of them and we'll sort of interrupt you and ask them, Amy. So we'll monitor them for you. You don't have awesome. to worry about it. And uh, we'll go from there. Magic. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to switch to my big screen. Please stand by. Stop sharing. So let me explain a bit of the story about how what me and Matt got up to. I'm going to move my notes over here. So the main story that Matt was came to me with was he had a bunch of files coming into a Gmail email account and he wanted to or every day I think you had someone going in didn't you Matt and she was going in and moving files around and putting them in various folders in SharePoint that you then picked highly, up into your... Yeah, highly repeatable process of downloading the same file, putting it into the same folder every day, nice. basically. Yeah. Um, so we actually, what we did was every time something drops into that um, email inbox, we were able to then basically put it where we needed to, split the files up, put them in its folders, um, and basically get rid of the human. Um, no, we didn't get rid of the human. They still have a job. It's OK. They just went and did something more useful. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you out of a job. Um, so first things first, we're going to start with the flow. A little bit of housekeeping. It's quite tempting when you come into make.powerapps.com. You quite often hit this URL here. Um, and I know with Power BI, I don't know if this has changed recently, but you guys don't have much of a concept of like a release cycle and where you build things. You just go straight into Power BI and build stuff. You've got your workspaces, I think. There's a magical thing called the default solution, and apparently you should never, ever, ever build in it. There's a bit of a story of why. The main thing is if you really stuff it up, you can't roll back your default environment. So if you're going to build, don't build in your default environment. Amy's but what is this, Amy, what is this Power Apps versus Power Automate? Are they the same thing or a subset yeah, of the same thing? Yeah, they're basically the same thing. Because if I open a flow, it, yeah, they're yeah. basically, they're, what they do is exactly the same now. They will eventually merge into one, I hope. But either go make.powerapps.com or make.flow.com. Oh, wait, that might have changed actually to powerautomate.com. And um, that was an official announcement recently. Here we go, flow.microsoft.com. No. Oh, I think they've officially changed it's it. Make, yeah, they've officially changed it. Yeah, that's make a big the thing. Oh, exciting. Um, but they are very much going into the same thing. The most important thing is that you check what environment you're in. My advice is always build in an environment that isn't the default one and always build in a solution. If you build in a solution, it means you can move stuff around. You can package it up. You can roll things back. You've got more control about what you're doing because it's really tempting to just go here and click create and you're firing away. But then your flow doesn't live in a solution. You can't move it. It's stuck um, and various other things. So Amy's advice, always build in a solution. I created one earlier. Here's one I prepared just to make sure that my flow would actually work. So first things first. Um, we're going to pretend those aren't there because I just wanted to make sure things were going to work. We're going to build an automation Cloudflow automated. There's already a connector for, for Gmail, as there is for Outlook. I could have done Outlook. I could have done Gmail. Um, but using the case that we don't always have to live in the Microsoft world to make things happen, we're going with Gmail. So there's my connector already pre-built for me. I've not built this. I've literally just plugged it in and turned it on. Um, so you'll see here we've got the ability to be able to filter or we can just receive everything. So we're going to go with an all you can eat method to start with. Um, and we're going to also one thing we change here is to say we do want the attachments. So we're allowed to in include things that have got attachments and we want the att attachments to come through. So what I'm going to do is this is my Gmail inbox and I'm just going to send an email to that with some attachments. So first things first, I, well, this is one thing that I taught Matt that I thought was like stuff that I just did, but apparently it's quite useful. So I've got this action. I don't really know what I want to do next. I don't know what's going to come out of that. So the first thing I always do is use a step called compose. 
Um, or if you want to sound fancy, I call it composé. It's it's composed. Um, and if we click on that again, if you've done anything with Power Automate, you'll see that on the right hand side, it gives me a bunch of things that apparently it passes back and um, that I can choose to shove like and do stuff with. But rather than me trying to build something before I know what's coming back, I tend to just put something. Usually the body is usually a good thing to dump in, and that basically gives me everything that's coming back. Um, there's also a lowercase body, so let's go with that one. And that's all my flow is going to do. I'm going to run it and I'm going to see what comes out the other end. Because once I can see what's coming out, I can decide what I'm going to do with it. And so I'm just going to save that. And I'm also going to prepare an email. And we're going to send an email to amyholton at gmail.com. Some files. Let me know if the dog noise in the background is annoying and I'll send them outside to go and play on the road or something. And I'm going to attach some files. And we've got just a bunch of files. We're just going to dump all those in, see what comes out the other end. And you can see I've got some pictures, some spreadsheets, um, some PDFs, um, an unexpected file. And we're just going to talk through how we maybe handle these, put them in different places and see what happens. Hello. So we're going to drop that in. That should have hopefully saved. It will give you a nice little name to start with, but I really recommend you name it something useful. So email to from Amy. Completely optional. So we've created it now for the first time. If we want to test it, we can see we've got this little test guy up here. For the first time, because we've not got any previous runs, it's not going to offer us anything and we can only do manually. And then it basically just says. Go and trigger your workflow. And you're like, oh, thanks. That was really not helpful. So what we're actually going to do instead is we're going to go back to here. We're going to open it up again. And hopefully that email I just sent is going to land in the inbox shortly. And it will create a run for us. So this is our details page and we can see the 28 day run history here. We should be able to shortly, I love a good live demo, see the run in here. Let's see if it's landed in the inbox and how quickly this picks it up depends on the agreement that the way the APIs have been set up because obviously it's a Google API. So it doesn't obviously poll every second. So it's just, it's not always snap instant. There's always some time to fluff around here. There we go, thank you. So this is just purely so that I've got now I've got a run that I can use again and again for my testing, but I also get a chance to see like what on earth comes out. The fact it says click to download doesn't mean it's blank. It means there's absolutely loads that's come out and it's freaking out. Handy thing to install here is JSON formatter because what it's going to do is format that so I can read it properly. Obviously, there's quite a lot of stuff in here because it's also put all the images into base 64 and usually crashes my browser. So I should have sent a smaller section through that time slide. So what I actually care about for this is what are my what are the attachments that have come in? And based on the attachments, I'm going to route them to various places and shove them into the right places in a SharePoint folder to start with. So we've got three folders in my SharePoint folder. We're keeping it quite simple, but we can extend this. I've got daily reports. How do I install JSON formatter? It's one of my favorite things. You Google it and go JSON formatter. And it's just a Chrome add-in. And it's really, really handy. So every time you open up a piece of JSON, it detects it and makes it look pretty. I can put the link in the chat. So I mean, there's a question about how to install JSON formatter. I think there's no installation, right? You just yeah. That's fine. I just answered the question. Oh, you just and answered that. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't paying I'm attention. Obviously, <laughs> I know. You're I'm always like, so fast. I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Um, it's because it popped up on my screen. To be fair, which highlights my inability to put myself on silent. Um, so we've got our three folders in SharePoint. And then what was I going to do? So we're going to shove things into various places in here. So we're going to go back to my flow and the main thing that we care about is the attachments. We're not too worried about anything else for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update this compose and I'm going to see if it can send me 
attachments content. So let's have a look. Here we go. So let's spit out this. So yeah, you can see that all of a sudden this apply to each has come in. If I have put anything into here that it's there's more than one, it automatically looks after you and gives you the, the apply to each. So that's obviously an item from the attachments. But then what I want to do is actually just get the full body of the attachment as well. So you can see we've got apply to each content bytes and it's actually put in here what the full thing is here. So body slash attachments. What we're going to do is obviously we're going to like to loop through, but I know in here has attachments, list of attachments. Here we go. So if I add another compose step here, what we're going to be able to do is get out all the attachments as a list. List of attachments. And now we know because that one, it hadn't given me an apply to each, which means there's only one of them. So let's just run that. And the nice thing is now that I've previously done this test run, I don't need to send myself an email every single time. I can reuse it. So I can reuse the trigger from the most recent one, recently used trigger, this one. So then I don't have to keep going and sending myself an email. And we're going to start with something quite simple. So let's say that our first rule is um, anything that's an image. My this, this client keeps sending me photos of a dog or along with the reports. So I don't really care, but I'm going to put them somewhere else. So we're going to show all the photos into dog photos. So let's go to, sorry, I get excited when I open up all these tabs, start flicking around. So let's have a look at the flow run. So in the first one, we have got, come on, show me, show me. That's a big one again. So let's have a look at this one. We can see it's picked up 11 files. Oh, geez, I didn't want all of that. I just want the file name. Sorry, please stand by. Let me go for something else. Attach, attachment name. That's a good start. Show me that one. I don't want to see the other ones. Because obviously every time it spits out a file, it's giving me all the base 64, which is going to absolutely kill me. I don't know what happened there, Amy. Maybe my screen froze. I don't know if everyone else's. So what you just did was you removed the attachment list and you added attachment name. Yes, into your I did. Compose. Sorry. That's OK. Apologies on behalf of the internet. So here we can see the names come through, which is great. So here's my 11 files. I've got 2.jpg, 3.jpg, etc. So I think the first thing I want to do is maybe filter down to a smaller list um, that's just images. So we're going to assume they're all just JPEG. So thank you, Matt. Good save. It's probably my computer. So first things first, we're going to filter. So we know that this is actually all of the attachments. Then I believe what I did last time with Matt is there is actually a filter function. Filter an array, because this is an array that comes out, hence we saw the JSON. So we can actually use this input and filter it using a nice UI. So sometimes when you copy and paste things, if you see it come in with ats and curly brackets, that's obviously not worked because I copied this, and it came out like this. Sometimes it doesn't, so delete the last curly bracket the first at the first curly bracket, pull that out, shove it in as an expression. Magic. And then you'll think it's gone wrong. And then what happens is, if you save it, because ideally I want it to look like this one, save it and refresh it. If in doubt, save and refresh. And when I reopen this, it's going to look a lot smarter. Ta da! Magic. Another thing I advise everyone in Power Automate, make sure you use the make.powerautomate.com and then go to your Power Automate settings and turn on experimental features. Don't be scared. It just makes it a much nicer experience for expression editing. So if you come in here now and I show you the expression editor, much nicer. You can actually work with it. You can scroll, whereas the other one's like this tiny line that's like two centimeters long. So we're going to filter through the attachments and we're going to filter for, I'm wondering if there's actually a file extension. File type. Attachments content type. I've got it there. Yeah, I'll take that one. So the type of content is equal to, I'm going to go with dot JPEG. 
but also I'm not 100% sure what's coming out. So what I'm going to do is pull up my apply to each above. This is why I like that I can just kind of play around with it so that I can pull into here my content type. Oops. So let's give that a run. I'm going to get rid of this one because it's a big ugly one. So here we're going to loop through and see what content types there are. And hopefully in here we should be able to get out just the ones that have got JPEG. And then what I will do after that is loop through these to get the count of how many are in that. Actually, no, let's show off with a, a condition. So again, compose is where I just dump stuff. I want to try stuff out. Out rows in Power Automate. Again, a story of my life is Google. I'm sure you used it because of Power BI. I can't remember the syntax. So what we're going to do on the next step is count how many rows come out. Da, 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 da. Length, length, there we go, got it. And again, it's obviously inconsistent and different. And if you start doing Canvas app language, it's different because they're really helpful. Um, but what we're going to do is look for the length of the body. So then in here, we should get a number of how many rows come out of our filter. So you see here we got length. Filter array, so hopefully I should get a number that's less than 11, but more than zero. Let's say. Oh, no, it's zero. Thanks, guys. OK, so I got my filter wrong, but now because I put this here, I can see what comes out. Here is where I went wrong. So the content output actually calls it an image slash JPEG. I said dot JPG. So instead, I need to change my condition to contains image slash JPEG. So change my filter and I'm going to say instead of equals, I'm going to say contains and I'm going to say image slash JPEG. Now this number should be more than zero. Like so quite like with Power Automate, I can keep running tests. It's like a bit of a playground. Um, obviously, at this point, I'm lucky that my flow doesn't add and automatically go and change anything else, so I'm not damaging anything. But I'll also show you a way that you can kind of test half of your flow and make it stop. So you can kind of test little pieces of it. So hopefully, there we go. So this time we got four back. So obviously I got the filter right. I've got four images. Sanity check if you would so wish. Let's have a look if there was four images. And there is indeed four images. Fancy that. So now we've got our four images. We're going to pick them all out of the email and we're going to shove them into a specific location in SharePoint. Shout if anyone's fallen asleep. Well, if you've fallen asleep, you're probably not going to shout because you're not listening, but let me know if someone's still there. It's all good. Um, so switch condition versus if condition. Let me add the two in and I just want to talk about why you'd use one rather than the other. Potentially you've heard what each one is, but I just want to show you because I'm a visual person. Condition is your typical if then else. If this, do this. If not, do this. It's a yes or a no, true or false. The nice thing about this is um we can use different syntax so for example like we said before this is where we might want to filter and say if the name oh yeah it's going to put it in a loop whatever if the name contains um hello so i might have the word hello somewhere in the name of the thing but it might not be at the start hence contains whereas if i use a switch statement the switch needs an exact value and it can only look in one place. So if this says it's going to look at the name for each one, it's going to go into a loop. It's OK. I'm cool with that. I need to get the exact name. If it's not the exact value, the switch statement doesn't care. It'll just go to its default. So quite often I find myself more likely to use conditions than I would be to use a switch. Both have pros and cons because um, obviously with a condition, I've only got one or another. So this is where we tend to start stacking things. You can either go as embedded. So you then you've got if yes, do this, if no, and then embed another condition. Like this. 
but just from the point of view of the UI, if nothing else, it gets so confusing because you end up going down this tunnel of doom and you never know when you're going to come out. Um, so what I tend to do, and this is something that I showed Matt, I tend to stack my conditions. And then obviously I don't want it to go through every single condition. So what you do instead is that at the end of the condition, after th something's been successful, there's a lovely little thing here called terminate, which sounds really drastic. Oh, it's not an inside for each loop. Cancel that. What did I do here instead? I'll show you that one later. <laughs> Just realized I totally screwed that up. I got carried away. So switch versus condition, we know what they are. Anyway, I went on a tangent because I've already used my filter, which is much nicer. So now I know that in here I've only got four items, my four images. So what am I going to do with them? I'm going to shove them into SharePoint. I'm going to clear up this stuff because that is just mess and noise. And in here I'm going to look for my SharePoint connection. And I'm going to create a file in SharePoint. It should pick up my connection or it might ask me to log in. Let's see what it does. I hope if nothing else, the dogs are mildly entertaining. Jesus Christ, doing my head in. Um, and here we have where I choose my site and my folder path. If you're doing this in the sense of you might set up a test SharePoint and practice shoving into that one first, you can use something called an environment variable. Let me finish this step and then I'll show you how I set up an environment variable and why you might use it. Note to self to come back to this. Um, so I'm going to plug it into my documents. I think that's where it is. So yes, this is my shared documents and this is where all my folders were. So I'm not going to, I'm going to go at this level and just say it's somewhere in. Oh, so these are going to be my dog photos. So actually I need to tell it where I want it. So shared documents, it's going to go in dog photos. And the file name, this is where I'm going to use the content from my previous array and it will create the loop for me. Why do something if someone else is going to do it for you? We're going to filter through and we're going to get the name of each thing. Does the loop for me and hopefully I can also get the content. So in theory that should give me everything. Let's see what happens. I love this game. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's run it. So obviously it's probably not that common that you're moving dog photos um, for your Power BI reports, but you get the concept that this could be with any kind of file type. I should probably have chosen the Excel one to use as an example, but hindsight, I got distracted by the dog photos, which is the story of my life. So let's see what disaster this creates. So we've got four in there. That's, that's a good start. Apparently it was successful. Apparently it did some useful stuff. Um, but a successful run does not always mean things went well. So let's go into dog photos and see what's come out. Oh, it's actually worked the first time that never happens. Um, and there we have our cute dog photos all in the dog photo file. Nice. Um, what's next? Let's talk about environment variables quickly. Please leave me alone. Um, and then I will talk about what other tool stuff we can do with document upload. Environment variables, what the hell are they? Well, you know, I sold you this solution thing and I got real excited about it earlier. Um, we're going to add it to the solution as well. I hope I'm not like boring people with stuff you already knew. And so I'm going to call this my SharePoint URL. Um, and that will be a text variable. And my default value for this is going to be here because I'm going to pretend that this is my testing place. Uh, da, 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 da. Ideally, I'd be in the SharePoint called test because I'm never going to test straight in production because I'm a good little developer. And the nice thing here is that I can use this in my flow. This then be now becomes a variable within my flow. It also means that when I do a release, so I export my solution, I deploy it, I can change that value in one place, 
and everywhere that I've used that variable will automatically be updated. So I don't have to go in afterwards and start manually updating things. Environment variables are reasonably new. Gee, they're good. Like I do question how I how we used to do this kind of stuff before. Um, so I'll show you how I replace one with the other and highly encourage you to use environment variables. Just makes life so much easier. So hopefully here I should be able to add a custom item. And of course my environment variables are not there because things don't always work when you try and actually show people things. So I will come back and plug that in in a second. But for now, um, environment variables is a file name unique and metadata. Cool. OK, other things. I could potentially have someone come and name the file the same thing every day. And by default, and I've never worked out how to change this from flow. If I go and run this flow again, it will override these images. These could be images, it could be filed. Please pretend these images are files because I should have gone with files in the first place. It's going to override them, whereas actually you might want to keep a copy um, and you might want to be able to store the date, for example, when you are uploading them. So first we'll just run that theory past us to check that when I run this again, there's still only four in here. So let's run that theory past us first to make sure I'm not talking absolute rubbish. Da, 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 da. Cool. So I think now it's going to prove me wrong completely and there'll be two copies of everything. Yeah, so it overrides. So you need to make sure the file name is unique. Otherwise, unless you want to always override, but ideally what I've found in my circumstances is you always want to keep the files and you need to either Assume they're not unique and add something, which is option one, or first check if it's unique and then make it unique otherwise. So we'll go with option one first, which is assume that it's all, or you want to append something to the end that's going to make sure it's always unique. So for example, the date, it might be a daily file and we're going to append the date. So let's go into here. We're already in here, sorry. I'm opening another window necessarily because I love opening windows. I'm going to go to edit and here we're obviously dropping in the name. I'm wondering if there's actually an option to take the name without. No, there is not. That's OK. So currently this is the name and it's got blah, 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 dot PDF at the end. Or dot JPEG or whatever it is. Obviously, you want to put the additional stuff between that. So my ideal title is something like. Obviously, my image is called something boring like image one. And then I want a space Then I maybe want to say the date. So what is it? 20 September 2009, 20 22, for example. Dot JPEG. But obviously at the minute I've just got the full name. So we're going to do a little bit of gymnastics here. A bit of gymnastics. And again, the Amy Classic is always to stick in a compose step so I can see what's going on. I will eventually, when I finish a flow, delete all these things. But when I'm building stuff, this is how the magic happens. So we're going to make another condition. First things first is that we want to split and only take the first half. So we want to remove the .jpg. Um, so a nice one for this one is replace. And we're going to take the name of the item. And we're going to replace dot. Is it .jpg or .jpg? .jpg. .jpg. And if wherever we find .jpg, we're going to replace it with nothing. So that's going to strip out the .jpg. That's the first part. So then we got just the name, no file extension. Next, we want to put the date, month, and year um, as date. So that's going to be format date time. And then what time is it? So you obviously want now. And again, I have this magical. Um, I don't actually remember any of the syntax. I just copy and paste. And this is my growing list of stuff that I can never remember. Um, so my old classic favorite is time zones. 
So there's a really nice function called uh, UTC now, which basically tells you the current time right now. So I'm going to paste this in and then I'll talk you through it. So this is convert time zone, get the time now, convert it to Australian Eastern Standard Time. And this is the format that I want. So I just want date, date, month, month, year, year. And again, this is all kind of standard date format stuff. Um, I will, if I can remember, find the link to give to you so you can find other formats. Um, so that's going to append the date. And then we want the document extension, which is on the end of this. Everything after the dot, right? This is where I need to remember what to do. So we've got the dot, then I want to be able to build a, a syntax that pulls everything after the dot and puts it at the end of this line. So I believe we can do, I'm going to write it all by myself. First, we'll start with split. The split will split the name out. And every time it finds a full stop, it'll split it out and make an array. I know there's only two and I want the last bit. So that's going to create my array and then I'm going to wrap it in last. This is me pretending I'm not a developer. So that basically says, split the name into an array where every time you see a dot like doing like format columns to text kind of thing and i only want the last one in theory this is going to give me the file name the current date and time and year in australia sydney and the dot extension in theory that's my theory i'm going with let's see if i'm gonna a embarrass myself or b absolutely nail it <laughs> Very peaceful. I have no idea what you're chewing. <laughs> okay, let's see. It's not failed, which is always a good start. And again, this is why I like my compose. <laughs> Isn't she good? It looks rubbish because the file name is called one, but we can see here the file name worked. And if I refresh in here, Da, da, da. We've got all the copies. Obviously, ideally, I'd have a space between the one and that would be more creative, but you can see that actually works, which is nice. Um, so just to give you an idea, if there's a lot of manipulation you can do, you're not stuck with just the name. There's a lot of like, if you don't know how to do it, you can generally Google it and find out there's so much out there. And um, so that just gives you an idea of what you could do with the names of standard formats. Matt, do you have a question? I saw you. Yeah, before. so yeah, so um, if you could go back to the flow and I'm just sort of going to maybe ask if you would just explain again how each yeah. of these steps passes to the next step, because this is certainly one of the things that I struggled with when I first started looking at this. Was uh, It wasn't clear to me how the first step in this flow passes to the second step, passes to the third step. Maybe you could just um, revisit that and, yeah. and show how that handoff works. So I think the best way is to look at a flow run. So if I just open up that last flow running, I'll show you how you can trace it through. That would be a nice way to ask. No, thank you for that question, because I get so excited and carried away. Oops, that's not it. That's the little one we did last time. So I can go here and open up any of the flow runs that I've done previously. We'll pick up the one I just did now. And let's go through that one. So it's quite nice that you can kind of see everywhere along the way what's included and what's not. And there's always this option to kind of show raw inputs or to click to download and see everything. So if we look through, we can see the emails arrived, inputs, is, we said it's inbox and we didn't filter anything at this stage. I'm not going to say click to download because I know my computer's going to cry. Um, and then we can look through the apply to each. And again, you can kind of see what's going on. Compose step is so simple. Like what you put in is what comes out. It's a bit confusing to look at, but basically this is your app. If you've got an apply to each, you can flick through each one and see what's going on. And then every single step has an in and an out. These ones are quite big because again, we've got the images, so it's kind of screwing with it a bit. But every time you've got a step, you've always got an in and an out. This one's quite a nice one to look at because you can see what's come in and what's come out. So this is the create file step. And um, this one's going to be big and ugly, I think, because that's got the image in it. 
and the JSON format, I can't deal with the size of the file. But if we look at what's come out, for example, sometimes it gives you a nice little interface to dive into as well. So let's have a look at this. I was hoping something would fail so I could show you how to error handle as well. Um, so yeah, we can see here the JSON quite nicely formatted. You can kind of see what's going on. I can see what the file name was. So it's quite nice that you can actually go back and even if something's successful, but it's not coming out with the right thing, you can kind of trace through and see what's going on. Does that answer the question? Yep, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for asking. And um, the other way, cool little thing that I think is going to be useful for this kind of thing that you're doing is you might not always want to change the file. So, for example, this is unique now, but if I run it again on the same day, it's not unique. The day hasn't changed. So, this isn't guaranteed to always be unique either. I actually end up learning this from a completely different scenario, but it's really helpful here. So let but if me, you put time, if you put time to the second, it's going to be. You unique. could add a timestamp. There is the option of the timestamp, but there is also a way that you can actually go into the folder, check if it's unique. If it is unique, change it. If not, leave it. So I'll just show you the action for that one. The only reason I know this is for something completely different, but it was quite interesting and it's a useful little action to know. So this one was a little bit scary because we have to use. Let me double check which action I use, get file properties only. Cool. Let's jump into the flow. So before I create the file, I can do a check, which is quite nice. And what we're going to do before we create, we're going to go for get files from SharePoint properties only. And I might be able to actually show you how to use the environment variable now. Sometimes shows up. No, still getting a bit shy. I'll show you later. Maybe never. Who knows? So for now, we'll hard code things. So what I can use with this step is basically to do a search and it's going to tell me if it found a match or not. And then I can act accordingly, which is quite nice. Um, so we're going to check in the dog photo folder. And then if I go to show advanced options, you can also do filter queries. So this one is I'll leave for equals. Mm -hmm. um, filter query you can build it that way or you can also change it here and it's O data. How do I know this is the syntax? Because I wrote a blog about it because I found it on someone else's. <laughs> I don't actually know how you work this out, but this is basically saying if the file name is, is, is the file name the same as file name. That's obviously not the file name. We want to pull in the compose three. So this is our file name that we're proposing, right? So let's have a look. We're going to drop this into here. Compose is a little bit confusing if you don't rename them, but I'm looking compose three here is my outputs. That's a thing that I want. So instead, I'm going to say if file name is the same as my proposed file name. And then what we can do is this is a fun one. We're going to have to have a condition to say basically if this returns a result, that means there is a match. If not, there isn't a match and then we can act accordingly. This this little query that I'm about to show you, I use so much in Power Automate because I don't want to assume it's always blank and I don't want to assume it always full. Um, so this is our magic friend called empty. So I'm going to build out the syntax and show you. So I want this condition to check if this came back. So empty outputs. No, it's not. It's body. I want body. Empty. And then you want to grab the body from here. So is the body empty? And do I need value as well? I'm not sure. Let's try that. So what I'm basically saying here is, did I get any results from that? And obviously it's kind of a double negative. So if we say empty is false, that means something came back, which means it's not unique. So expression false. So I'm going to rename stuff as well. Say file name not unique. 
And now we should see some different things come through here. And I actually, I think all of them will fall into this. And all I'm going to do here is drop in the file name. Obviously, this is where you change the name accordingly. I'm not going to go to that detail because you're all going to fall asleep if you haven't already. But I just want to show you what's going to come out the other end. Um, and I'll show you as well where I keep all these handy little bits of syntax. One second, my screen just died. So assuming these should all come through as empty. Empty is false, so there is something that's come back. So this means a file name is not unique. I'll copy this into the other one as well. You can, yeah, it's the clipboard. Let me tell you the clipboard. Oh my gosh. Um, copy the clipboard, add an action, my clipboard. Copy paste. Oh, it didn't work. Maybe because I'm in apply to each. Sometimes it's a bit temperamental. But there is a clipboard and generally it works. But obviously because I'm showing you, it's not going to work. So I will do it myself. And I realized there was a question in the chat, which I'm going to try and open up on multitask. Is Google free connected for flow included in the standard N365 license? I think it is. Because it's not showing me premium M any anyway when I add it. Let's just double check. I'll show you how to check. Let's look at Gmail. Yes, it's not showing as premium, so I don't think so. I'll show you how I know it's Premium. So, for example, if I look at the Dataverse, which we all know is not free, you'll see it's got premium. So I believe that the Gmail one is part of the free standard connector. Good way of answering the question by pretending I don't know and Googling. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, so I'm just going to copy and paste the input from there into there, and hopefully everything goes to the left, assuming I've built this syntax right, which doesn't always happen. see what's happened. Annoying thing with the loop is when it's running, you can't see what it's doing until it's finished. Slightly annoying, but it is what it is. I'm assuming everything goes to the left here. Yes. It's going to create them anyway, but it's going to try. And we're still going to have the same number of files because it's always going to override them. And my flow is checked. So ideally what I build into this flow is to say, if it's not unique, do something, append something, do something smart. Obviously, I haven't here, but we can see here for each of them, it's always gone down the true route. So this and this kind of checking things and saying, did you get a result or not? Really useful bit of syntax. Um, for handling your flows. OK, I realize it's 20 past six and I've talked a lot. I'm just going to check if there's any other really exciting ones. OK, one more and then I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions. So then it's a good time to think if you have any questions. I could go on all day about this. I hope someone said it was useful. Final thing, more about working with SharePoint, but I know that's probably quite likely going to be where you end up shoving things. Again, it's part of the M365 free license. Um, SharePoint, as you may or may not know, gets upset about certain characters um, in file names. Certain things it really doesn't like. Um, so for example, what I might do is try and break it first to prove that it does actually get broken. Just let me check. OK, it doesn't like um, ampersands. And I think if I put this in here and try and run it, I think it will fall over and cry ungracefully. Let's have a look. It's either that or it will fix it for me and my whole thing is completely pointless. Oh my God, it looks like a murder's gone on in this house. The little purple teddy is officially dead. If anyone wanted to know, the teddy definitely died. And so, Amy, just while that's refreshing, so once you set this up on your account and it's been configured and it's connected to your Gmail inbox, it literally just sits there and monitors that inbox 24-7, right? 
Yep. And if an email comes in, it looks like it responds within about a minute from my experience. Yeah. Um, and and so when I did this with Amy, I added a step after successful complete just to send me an email telling me that it completed successfully. And so every morning when I look in my email, I see it there and I, I literally just delete it, but it's just peace of mind to know that uh, the flow or that the file that I was expecting came in. Apparently it doesn't mind. Okay. I swear you used to not like ands and ampersands. Interesting. That was something else. Um, so yes, as Matt said, there's things you can do at the end to tell you what's going on. I think we also added, Matt, wasn't it, to delete the email out of the inbox? So Gmail is more than just doing a trigger. It's also got some different actions that we can do afterwards as well. Um, so yeah, one of them is just delete the delete the email from the inbox or to move it to trash or to also send an email. So it is useful to kind of finish that flow. If you want that reassurance, you don't have to come and log into here to check. Obviously you can just come and look at your flow runs because it's quite quite a nice interface. You can come into here. Da, 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 da. I can see my flow history. I can go to all runs and I can also filter within here as well to successful or failed. Obviously everything's been successful, which never happens to me, Christ. Um, so yeah, lots of things you can do, and obviously we're not limited to Gmail and SharePoint. Like the world is your oyster. I'm sure you've heard about. Oh, there's like 700 new connectors this month, and hey, look, you can press the button and get the weather, all that kind of thing. So Amy, maybe just uh, one other thing, because you had seven um, attachments, mm -hmm. you've successfully processed the JPEGs. So just can you just show the step of adding? How would you process the PDFs? With, without really having to do question. a without having to do a completely different um, yeah. flow. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm just going to run this so I can find out what the file name is that comes out. Because you know, I use, did I use this last time to check what the content type is? Because I think the content type is something solid. So I'm just going to run this again and check what the content type is for PDF. And you'll see that a lot of this we can reuse really, really nicely. So let's have a look at this one when it's finished. So that's a JPEG. That's a JPEG. Keep going. That one's a CSV. There we go. So application.pdf is going to have this in the name. So it's pretty much a case of, do you reckon we can get away with just doing that? I reckon all I need to do is change it here. I reckon everything else is flexible enough that it's just going to look after me. Yeah, but how do you how do you but how do you get both to work? Because what if you need to process all of the files? You've only showed how to process the JPEG. Uh -huh. So do you case. do a, do you do a branch or do you put them in series parallel? What do you do? Depends what you want to do. If you're just shoving them into, hmm, what would I do at this stage? I, I think what I think what you did with me was that you just added you basically copied the um, detach step and just put it in series so it, it would go to the first one that would process it yes and then then in I was expecting it to need to be in parallel but it you don't have to put it in parallel you just you just basically duplicate and add another um, repeat the process with a different file type yes you're right so instead of filtering here, what we do is actually put a condition within the loop. So what we do here, so rather than filtering at the top end, we could maybe filter to just application PDF and contains, I'm not gonna work out the complex one. So let's just get rid of the filter, rip it out, love this. And we're, instead of taking the input from the filter, we're gonna take the input with all of the files and we'll process it that way instead. So I want to take all the attachments into my loop. And is that still going to work? That's all still going to work. And then instead up here, we're going to say as a switch. No, your file name's not going to work because you would, 
searching for JPEG in the file name, and if they're PDFs, they're not going to have JPEG in it. It's all. This is all completely dynamic, though. In that re no the first, anymore. the replace. Now go back to the replace, the rename step, oh, where it says right. replace. Mm -hmm. You're right. So this is where you can nest um, replace syntax, so we can have more than one. We don't have to have one or the other. So we can actually nest the replace within a replace. And then the other one should be .pf. Da, 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 da. Let's see if that works. So then we're going to still branch based on, where is it? I want to get the attachment name. Yeah. Um, so the attachment name contains, we'll go with .pdf. Again, slightly different way of doing it, but that is that. What we'll do is, I guess actually what you could do, we're going to ignore the file name unique bit for now as well, because it's going to complicate things. Okay. You're dependent, that's fine. So we've got our file name above because it needs that. And then we're going to say if it contains PDF, we'll create the file. And this one's going to get pushed into da, 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 da. daily reports. Da, no, invoices. Invoices are always PDFs. So if it's an invoice, we're going to put it into the invoice folder if it's PDF. And then, like Matt said, what we can do is just reuse this. So if it goes down that route, happy route, if not, it's going to go down no. And this is where I can stack up my conditions. I'm hoping this lets me paste. I really do. Nice. In this one, instead, we're going to say dot JPG. I love a good copy paste. And then for this one, we're just going to say that it goes into dog photos. I'm hoping it picks that up. Been a bit rogue with that one. That is what I called it, isn't it? Yeah. So in theory, now this should loop through all the files. If it finds anything with a match of PDF, it'll create it here. If it finds anything with a match of .jpg, it's going to create it in doc photos. And anything else, we're just going to ignore it. I mean, it'd be nice, like if we had loads of files, we filter at the top. But with the number of files, I'm not too worried. I'm not too worried about killing my flow or overusing my API calls. If you're going to be a very well behaved developer, you would filter first. Let's have a look. We've got 11 files. Again, you've got to sit and wait until it's finished. I thought something was going to fail then. Let's go look here first. If I go to documents and go to invoices, there's your two PDFs, fancy that. And it's taken the name with it as well, which is nice. Um, just to prove a point that there was only two PDFs there, invoice one, two, three, invoice 2009. Um, and just to walk through the flow run, to see how it ran through that. So each time we look at the file, we can see what happened to it. So we'll walk through each path. So this one, fell into the second condition. If I was a good person, I would have updated the name of my conditions so that I could actually look through the flow run and know what's going on. So with hindsight, naming things is useful. Future you will be grateful. And I think that's the last lesson for me today. I could go on all day about this. Like I literally have thousands and thousands of things I could talk about. Um, main things I'm going to send links to. Actually, no, wait, no, I need to. I need to do the back to my slides for the, all the slides that I prepared. Are you ready? Let me share the right screen. My final tidbit for you is the carrot and the stick. Um, so there's a new feature coming out um, in Power BI, which this really makes me cringe. Better together is the cringiest thing ever. But now, you know, I raved about solutions earlier. Apparently now you can put Power BI reports and data sets into a solution. So now you can roll out everything in a solution in one place. And that's my carrot and stick as to why you should use 
the solutions. Topical questions. Hit me. Yeah. Okay. So, anyone have any questions for Amy? So, Amy, where? Oh, while well, anyone else might like to add a question into the chat, um, good learning resources. Where's a Where's a good place to oh, learn? Some good things? learning resources. And um, so, best thing for me is Dr. Google using the right words, and you usually end up on a forum or in someone's blog. Um, in terms of handy Power Automate syntax, let me chuck a couple of links in the chat. I do have them in my Power Automate in my slide as well. But if I throw in this one, this is something I was res half responsible for. It's called the Power Automate Gymnastics Guide. It's basically, you see that thing I had on my screen where I had that snapshot of all the useful stuff I use? It's mm -hmm. an online version of that. Um, so I never, like it's not often I'll actually write Power Automate syntax, so I often go there and grab stuff. Right. Um, I will do some such shameless self promotion since you invited me so nicely. So I'll also put a link to my blog and one recently I did with that involves kind of SharePoint data manipulation, file manipulation. I do quite a lot of Power Automate, even though I'm known for Dynamics Marketing. So that's a good place to go. And Dr. Google is your friend. Always not ashamed to admit that. And so there was a question there. Thank you for that. There was a question there from Oscar about what a solution is, but that was what you showed us right at the start, right? Where, where were you at the start? Don't 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 put it into the standard default. It's it's like an environment, right? It's basically an environment. It's basically like what I like to call it's like it's like a little box. Like the thing that you create lives in the environment, and then you're just putting it in a little box, so that then when you want to move it, rather than moving each thing. You've got a little box and you just go, here's a box. But also yeah, that, that, thing, that thing can live in lots of different boxes. So you can have it in lots of boxes if you want. But basically, it's a container for some stuff. Okay, great. Any other questions from anyone? Uh, Gabrielle, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Is that a syntax of its own also using Power Apps? So, yeah, is like, is it a different language altogether? The yeah, thanks, guys. Completely different. It's not even like an official language. It's literally like flow language. It's got a lot of similarities to, um, like, for example, what do you call it nowadays? Power FX. Apparently, someday we will move it all to Power FX, but for now, it's its own magical flow language. Testing part of a flow, you're right, I did miss that bit. Let me quickly show you. Good question. Um, let me switch into the right screen because that's completely the wrong thing. So is that, story of my life. There we go. It was the magic terminate step, you're right. I totally missed that, thank you for that question. So perhaps I want to just run this first step because you know this first step I was spitting out the attachments. Obviously, I've got my previous flow runs now, so it's not so bad, but maybe I don't want to go and create all the files. I just want to check some stuff here. There's a magic step called terminate, which sounds really dramatic, and it is. So this means that even if this step's successful, it's going to kill my flow right here. So if I test this now, save and test. Sorry, I've run over time. I hate it when people do that. You'll see here, even though it's successful, it stops right there. So that will kill my flow at any given point. You can also do the reverse where you say that even if the last step fails, just carry on regardless. Um, so there is this magical thing called configure run after. And I can say for this, I should only run this if it's failed, skipped, or timed out, because by default, it only runs after the step before it has been successful. But you can also tell it, just carry on regardless. It's fine. I don't care about errors at all. Um, so that's also a really handy one. So the also the, the flip side of that is that you just turn it off completely. So say configure run after. Can you turn them off? Yeah. Oh, you've got to have at least one, so that's not going to work. But for example, if you know it's going to fail, set it to timeout. It's not going to run. But be careful because then you forget what you've done. You wonder why everything's failing. But that's how you do that. Good question. Thank you for reminding me about things I forgot. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Yay. Christian. Yeah, so look, hopefully um, it was supposed to be an awareness session. Um, you know, a lot of us working in Power BI, Power Query every day, and there's just this whole other world out there. Um, I guess my, my advice to people would be, you know, have a go yourself, but also consider calling in some help if need be. I know I, that's certainly what I did with Amy and um, was able to fast track a solution. But uh, I think if you're aware that these things are possible, um, you know, you might go fishing to try and come uh, and come up with a solution that's going to add some more value to the to the business. So, so thank you very much, Amy. Thanks for sharing, for giving us your time. And uh, thank thanks everyone for joining. So keep an eye out. I think looks like we'd already announced um, Marco. I think uh, I saw someone put a link in earlier, so that's already out on Eventbrite. So, um, so that one will be face to face only, and. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to have a few uh, gratuitous prizes, Iman, and it'll be great to catch up with Marco again. So hopefully we'll see many of you there. Anything from you, Iman? Uh, I believe, Amy, you still run a meetup, right? Do you want to share your meetup if you uh, do that? I retired. Oh. I retired, oh. Iman. <laughs> no, it's still going on, though. There is the Australia user group um, okay. that's more dynamics, dynamics background, but we say it's Power Platform. It's still going on. And um, that's again once a month, similar to this, but obviously less Power BI, more the other side of the Power Platform. Oh, okay. um, I used to run it, but then I decided to retire. Got too old. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so I guess as Matt said, this is uh, important for everyone to know all components of Power Platform because it can be very handy, and that's really uh, something that can help you in your toolbox when you need to create a quick you know, automation and workflow and with Power Apps, sometimes you need to create a form for data entry or some of those scenarios that you need to have data in and update. So definitely I recommend uh, having a look at Power Platform in, in a, like a bigger context of Power BI. Thanks so very much, Amy. Solution. Okay, yes, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. we can share this right. uh, video with everyone. Uh, and if there's any slide deck, Amy will share with us and we will send it to you. Thanks, everyone. No dramas. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks all. Thanks Bye. Thanks for having me. Good night.